good afternoon everybody we welcome you all on the occasion of this endowment lecture instituted in the name of late shrimati abha maiti since 1994 the society has instituted this endowment lectureship with a generous fund provided from the members of the family and it is being held every year and this year our speaker is professor nirmala banerji who retired from the center of studies in social sciences kolkata as a professor of economics abamaiti as you know was a celebrated personality among the women in this country she was educated from calcutta and obtained her ma and also degree in law and then she joined politics and at the age of such early years she became member of the legislative assembly then parliament and also became ministers in both state and in the center ministry under the prime ministership of late moradji desai and this lectureship has been continuing since then and when we approached professor nirmala banerji she readily agreed and today we are anxiously waiting to hear her lecture so professor nirmala banerji please namaskar i am very grateful to the asiatic society for inviting me to give this lecture in honor of shrimati abhamaiti abhamaiti was a freedom fighter and also participated in the quit india movement she then was an important member of the congress party for a long time was in the parliament was in also a minister later on she joined the janata dal government and uh, mraj bhai desai as a minister but her own interest was rural people and their welfare and i share that interest with her so i'm doubly honored to be giving this lecture the topic of my lecture today is india's gender norms and the way they react in the society and the society and uh, determines social and economic reactions many of you might think that this is an esoteric subject and when somebody who is uh, like me who is supposed to be a trained economist there are many developments happening in the country at the moment a deepening depression falling employment a general crisis of confidence and i should not be wasting my time on such an issue but i want to show that actually india generating norms have very important solutions for some of its puzzles and also explain the background of its social policies now feminists in general use the word gender gendering very often but most social scientists ignore it so the historians continue to write his her history rather than her story and anthropologists are like polly hill have long been blaming all <coughs> development economy economists for ignoring the variety of gender forms in different societies in their analysis of development but I, today i would like to talk to you about that what then do we understand by the term gender simone de beauvoir in her important book uh, the second sex made the statement that women are not born but they are made which means that in human society reproduction uh, implies not just biological activities of giving birth and breastfeeding but also 
including, including activities of social reproduction, which means rearing a child to become an adult and socialize into ger its genderling role. In other words, gender comprises the social construct which indicates how a person is either, of either sex is expected to behave, to speak, to dress, and even to think of herself. <coughs> Gendering is the process through which a newborn child is gradually turned into a gendered adult of any sex. And the agencies that do this are the family, but also the neighbors, what will the neighbors say, the community, the social norms, this is how it is always done, and religion, no, nastri svatantra marahati, everything works into that uh, respect. The, therefore, the general assumption is that men and women play complementary roles in a social, natural social order of which men are the decisive powers because, because God-given super, superior brain, uh, mental and physical powers and everybody is supposed to assume, accept this uh, assumption. There has been some attempts to envisage a society where women are the superior sex, not men. Gandhiji, for example, believed that women with their moral rectitude, their sex uh, attitudes of self-sacrifice and their modesty are better suited to be the satyagrahis that he needed for his struggle. But we must know for this, the women had to be uh, celibate and either widows or unmarried and give up their feminism and their domesticity. Several feminists have also tried to prove that uh, women are the superior sex. Vandana Shiva, for example, in her book, Staying Alive, says that as nurturers by in tradition and practice, women are nearer uh, Mother Earth and therefore better suited to be caring for the environment. Several of us have argued against this, saying that this really typifies a woman in her role as a nurturer and an essential role as a nurturer and neglects all the achievements that women have done in the last several centuries. Many Indian, similarly, Many Indian feminists now claim that all women's work is care work. I think that term demeans women because we know that women have been working on all types of jobs, starting from Supreme Court judges to the village woman who looks after her family's welfare and um, uh, also does many, um, multiple tasks just to get for the survival. The labeling of obfuscates their vital contribution for survival of a large section of Indian population. So let us then go, you know, you know, everywhere there is a kind of an assumption that there's a there are some jobs that are men's jobs and some jobs that are women's jobs. So even if that line keeps on shifting, Everybody believes inherently that there are such things as women's jobs and such things as men's jobs. So what is this? This is called the sexual division of labor and it's been also used by theoreticians and uh, in many disciplines for a long, long time. It's, uh, so what does it mean? Does it mean we know in all societies that every possible work except for birthing and breastfeeding are done by either men or men, women at some time, somewhere. And so it's not as if the jobs are absolutely hard, nature given. So why is then this talk about a sexual division of labor? Feminists argue that when a society is already accepted an unequal structure of power between the two sexes, 
it then needs to divide the work uh, as per on section lines. So, in other words, the division that society works is not of tasks, but it is of the power to decide who does what and how, and how that is evaluated by the society. One sex, usually the male, has powers over all, for, over all, all aspects of women's body, uh, lives their bodies, their sexuality, and their labor. And the, it's social groups have tacit norms about how women should dress, how they should wear, and when they should be seen, where they should expose even their face, in what societies, in what kind of circumstances. There are also strong restrictions on the kind of work they do and the locations in which they are permitted to do the work. Okay. Controls on these aspects, three aspects of women's lives are interdependent. That is, controlling one aspect implies putting some controls on other aspects as well. In fact, possibly controls on one aspect are meant, uh, main, meant basically to control, fortify controls on other aspects. For example, controls on women's bodies and their sexuality are, put, are, are controls that give, the, give men the power to decide what work women will do, how the, what, the, what its outcomes can be, and who decides what, what is to be done, right? And also, even if these everywhere the norms are set by men, it's not necessarily that their outcome is supposed to be the same. For example, as Naila Kabir has shown, the fact that many of the newly developing countries in the late uh, last quarter, quarter of the 20th century uh, had started getting uh, many jobs for women from multinationals on uh, young women in to the extent that some many countries manufacturing workforce became feminized. But this, even if all the women were doing the same kind of jobs and they were the same kind of women, the impact in, on their social position in their society differed widely. So it's not that gendering loses control when something uniform happens to women. So, in our society, gendering works mainly through emphasis on the sanctity of women's chastity, containing women's sexual, women's sexuality strictly within marriage in the, is the main consideration of families in socializing women and molding them into the kind of person that they approve of. Women are drilled from childhood onwards to accept that chastity is their most important and valuable endowment. It is important to note that imposing these strict, strict controls on women's sexuality is the best instrument of patriarchal authorities for manipulating women as workers. It is basically the fear of assault on the chastity that induces women to accept controls on their bodies, dressing as per norms of decency, as well as in many cases their choices of work. It compels them to be wary of working with strange men at all or odd times without assurance of some special protection. In fact, the current social and political outcry against the brutal gang rape and uh, more torture and murder of young women that we've heard in the last several years is I, I wonder whether it's really about the uh, the physical assault and uh, death or is it about the rape alone the rape is probably matters much more to our society sexual division of labor then is basically about what who has the power in that society to decide who is to do what, 
what work, under what conditions, and how that work is to be evaluated. Gender division of labor thus creates characteristics and at, uh, an additional category of workers of women. We have the labor market category of male workers and women workers. I'm saying that there is a third category which is which can be labeled as women workers and it has some special qualifications that I will talk about next. I have del what then is a woman worker? I've deliberately used the word what rather than who because a woman is not, oh, a woman worker is not so much a person as a construct, as a social construct designed and molded into that role by family pressures and social authorities. Defined that way, women workers have the following characteristics. First is, woman has little control over her own labor. When many, with marriage or with even just by birth, many tasks accrue to her automatically on marriage, on many more can be loaded on her if the circumstances of the family require. But these are beyond her control. Second, secondly, because women, especially rural women, have to constantly be multitasking to change from one job to another and mixing them with her house, mixing economic activities with their, with their housework and so on. They have, their labor therefore has to be infinitely fair, flexible. So they have to move from one job to another whenever required. Thirdly, since families tend to place all the new, uh, all the load of extra responsibilities on women. The working hours of women are therefore elastic. Suppose a woman comes to, takes up a job commuting to Calcutta to work as a domestic service. That doesn't really mean that she has to, her uh, responsibilities for the family to uh, cook or to uh, uh, do the housework are removed. She will extend her hours to do that work as well uh, along with her work as paid work. This fourthly, I think because the woman is molded into these uh, thinking that she accepts this part as being a woman, there is no need for a control and also complete supervision all the time. Families can leave it to her and the woman will do the work as by her own will in a way and particularly it's even she works if even if she works in the family's productive work productive uh, industry she is not given any credit for it neither does she get paid nor is it acknowledged may i will give the example of uh, handloom weaving in which uh, women do most of the work of uh, uh, starching the yarn, drying it, and coloring it if necessary. But even the census records or the families ever tell you that the, there are women workers in that industry. As I mentioned uh, earlier, in the lab, what happens in the lab, labor market where women are women supposed to be female workers, not male, uh, you know, as different from my woman worker. As I mentioned earlier, India was one of the few developing countries where policies of economic liberalization did not lead to feminization of the manufacturing workforce. This somewhat atypical experience can also be shown to be the result of its gendering pattern. In almost all countries, developing and developed, young women, when they finish schooling or when they reach their teens, take up a job and work on it till they get married in their 20, 20s or somewhere and have children. After that, they drop out of the labor market, which means that the women's workforce participation rate, uh, if you draw a curve of it against their age, by age line, you find that 
For most countries, it peaks early in the late teens or early 20s and then drops sharply. And may, the women may come back to the labor market after the children grow up. But that is the shape that uh, we have. In India, on the other hand, young girls are not allowed to... Uh, in India, on the other hand, are supposed to get married after puberty. Until they get married, the families prefer them not to work anywhere outside uh, outside their family control. And it is after they get, they're supposed to get married and not work in, so they don't come into the labor force in that. In, however, when they reach their 20s, most young women find that they are now, their family now needs their, their earning in particularly rural India. So that the, their labor force participation rate starts rising, but later in the mid-20s and goes on rising till the mid-30s, the mid-30s, 40s. Then it may fall again. So it's a different curve completely from the world that you see for most countries in the world. This, this, but, but when they do come to the labor force in the 20s, they're already encumbered with childcare and housework, so they cannot accept the kind of hours that the manufacturing industry needs them to work for. The gendering further ingrains into men, both men and women the myth of men being the chief wage earner of the family and woman being a secondary, her income uh, being secondary to the family welfare. Male tra dominated trade unions regard worker women as secondary earners and often sacrifice their rights for the benefit of those in the workers. For example, in 1960s, the engineering industry of Bengal, the wages in that were rationalized under the tripartite agreement, in which the job of winding fan circuits, which was considered a skilled job, was now, uh, now begin, begin to receive a higher rate of wage. Till then, this was a women's job. But now that the wages had gone up compared to the average wage of the male worker, that job was the trade unions persuaded the management to make it a male job and women lost that job completely. Or, however, we can see in the, um, in the collieries, for example, in the collieries, when collieries got uh, nationalized in the in 1970s the jobs became organized sector jobs with much better working conditions so the trade unions immediately not immediately but over time within the next five six years persuaded women workers workers were allowed to nominate one worker in their place if they leave, left the job so they persuaded women to nominate some male member and give up the job in his favor. So even old women were more married to young men so that they could give, nominate him in her place. As a result, the colliery employment of women, which was about 20% of the total workforce in 1973, fell sharply and by 1980 it was about 7% or 8%. Much has been now wrote about the interaction between women and economic development. Much has been written about impact on women of economic development, especially in our country. Esther Bojra, in her book, Women and Development, which was based on her field work in Africa, had put, put forward the thesis that as economic as an economy develops, the jobs that women were doing get shrink and women become dependent on men. So development is anti-women, anti-women's 
economic participation. Our country, the report from the Status of Women in India Committee in 1974 also accepted that, th that thesis on the basis of uh, the census data which showed that throughout 20th century, women's workforce participation rates had been steadily falling as the economy grew and developed. Many of us have worked on that thesis for some time, analyzed the data further to bring out much more nuances of it. But today I want to actually turn the question on its head and ask the other question. The, uh, what is what does gendering itself does to work, to economic development? What how does gender matter? What impact does our pattern of gendering has had on our economic development? I gave one example of the fact that after economic liberalization, India did not get uh, the multinational investment in manufacturing jobs mainly because its gendering norms would seem to be unsuitable for um, working in uh, that industry. But much more interesting is the question of how gender affects the technological choices in production. If in Far Irfan Habib, in his lecture, in his uh, paper, potentially is a Potentialities of capital development in the economy of Mughal India has shown that in Mughal India, the, all the preconditions of capitalist development were there. There was large accumulation of wealth with the neighbors and with the nobles and the emperors because of very strict exploitation of. Uh, agriculturists and uh, artisans who were made to pay taxes in uh, cash. This, well, this, uh, these, uh, well, you know, these, this extracted surplus was saved in form of wealth or used in commercial capital. And this in India already had a large manufacturing trade in export trade as well, and. It, the use of iron had been was known, and you, iron was in iron tools were in use, in particularly in warfare. But even then, India remained a country where technologies were not changed, and production continued as it was for many years, entirely through the uh, Mughal India period. Habib argues that because India had plentiful supply of such impoverished workers, decision makers of production producing manufacturers did not see the, feel the need to explore the potential of more efficient iron-based, metal-based tools. He says that change can be delayed in a particular situation for no other reason than that a tool of lower efficiency can be used in manufacture of the same commodities by use of cheap skilled labor. I want to argue that actually in India, in our household industry, I want to demonstrate that in India, in the household industry, technological improvements have been delayed or ignored mainly because producer families can use the unpaid labor of household women in place of available improved technology and potentially more profitable techniques. This bypasses the need for investing capital and taking some entrepreneurial risk. The sericul industry of West Bengal provides a dramatic example of this. That sericulture industry in Bengal is actually a very old industry, it has a recorded history to over 500, 600 years, and it was a large exporting industry. It exported yarn as well as piece goods with, uh, of uh, silk mixed with other fire fabrics, but other yarns. The East India Company introduced one 
technological change in the industry. It play, it brought in filature winding in place of Tuckley winding, Tuckley drawing of uh, yarn from the cocoons. But after that, the industry did not change its technology even till the 1990s. So it used the uh, women's labor to breed the, to rear the cocoons, and then men used bud grew silk from it and the katkai, which was a kind of a villager wheel. This, um, uh, in this entirely period, the export trade had vanished after the mid, mid, middle of 19th century because better silks, your better French and Italian silk became available in Europe. But the domestic industry continued and continued till uh, in, uh, independence. After independence, the KVIC, that body set up by the Indian government for helping house cottage and small industries did help the industry to survive by giving large subsidies. But the subsidies usually went to the middlemen and the growers got rearers of silkworm got very little out of it. The KVIC made very little changes in the technology of production in their country. So the in 1990s, the Indian government, along with the World Bank, started a project for upgrading the technology in Indian silk industry and by increasing its production for of better silk. The project was lodged in all the centers of silk growing in India, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Karnataka, Andhra, Kashmir, and West Bengal. And as a, we at the CSSC, the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, we were asked to monitor the project for West Bengal by the World Bank. And as a member of that team, I went to Maula, visited Maula to several times to see how the project was proceeding. And we found that actually West Bengal had almost rejected the project completely. The growers were still, the original idea was under the World Bank plan to introduce the Bivoltin kind of uh, silkworm, which is a Chinese worm imported, which gives much better quality silk, whiter silk, more textile, uh, more stronger yarn. Whereas the original industry that uh, had been using what they call the Nistari silkworm, which gives a kind of yellowish silk, but in much smaller quantities. The project was to introduce the Bivoltin uh, silkworm into Indian industry and to get the, uh, to make the cocoon growers follow certain norms of how to rear the worms, worms and then sell them in an auction market but he could immediately collect payment for it. And this project was very successful in Karnataka, in Tamil Nadu, but in West Bengal, as I said, failed completely. So we inquired why it was, what, what, what the problem was, why did the project not take off? We found that the original, uh, traditional uh, method in in, in West Bengal of uh, rearing cocoons was for uh, small and marginal farmers to grow some mulberry on their slightly high land and break the, bring, when the season started after the rains to bring the uh, leaves and small sticks in their home to feed the yarn. After that, their work in the industry was finished. The women took over. The household women maintained the trays, maintained the worms, cut the feed, fed the worms, cleaned their trays, and this they, this they did several times during the work and during the day. And each cycle was about 21 days. Last few days, this work of 
feeding and cleaning for the silkworm tray could take as long as 10 or 11 hours for the women and on top of their own housework. But this was, they were not charged for it. They, were, they, did, they didn't get any payment for it. They were, um, they became a... So for the cocoon grower, the cocoons were uh, whatever they could get out of selling that to the margin or to the middleman was net gain. There was no cost to that because the trays were housed inside the house where the woman could easily reach manage between the housework and the rearing work and they could they continued the crops throughout the season without any gaps in between or using any special trays for it or not. Naturally this the Bivoltin silk worm, which was a much more delicate worm, could not work under this, these conditions and therefore the, the hardy and nistari traditional variety was still in use. And the, and the, farm, the rear, rearing households did not see any need to use the auction market. They could just sell it to the middleman to get and they keep the middlemen happy so that they could get small loans from them as well. So this was a case where producers resisted introducing better technology in cocoon rearing and improvements in market practices, mainly because in their eyes, production with traditional techniques was costless. For households, decision makers, the long hours of work of their women and their problems of coping with multiple demands of housework and cocoon work was not a cost to be considered at all. Therefore, though there had been traditionally gendering traditions were such that women's work around the house, whether of cooking, cleaning, childcare, or, or for participating in the economic activity that contributed cash income to the family, were all considered as labor of love which had no place in the calculation of costs and returns. But the situation that I was talking about was mostly about the 20th century. What happens? What has happened in the new millennium to our gendering norms and how have they been acting with the economy? We have employment data till the middle of the second decade of this millennium, which showed alarming fall in women's employment, um, registered employment. There was a small bump in 2004-05, but it's been rapidly falling after that. And now recent reports that we all hear is that women's employment has fallen. Uh, an ILO report also says that this has been falling very sharply. So, but we don't know where women were working or what they were doing. And the question that I have before me is, actually, if employment is falling, why did poverty go down in the first decade of this uh, millennium? How did rural households do better in this? So I think employment is not really a very good guide for us to know about the livelihoods of households, how they manage to live. To find out more about the livelihoods, we, uh, our group, Sachetana, had started, uh, uh, had uh, undertaken a survey. Unfortunately, we couldn't publish the results because the uh, money ran out. But the survey was interested in looking for how households survive. So for this, we selected 500 households of, uh, of West Bengal, 310 rural and 190 urban households, of which the areas where the survey took place all over West Bengal, the areas were selected according to certain I ideas we had about the changes that had been taking place in the economy. 
but the households were selected from these areas, randomly selected. The purpose of the survey was to find out how household makes a living, how it manages its livelihood, apart from whatever employment data we have about that household. And as we suspected that most of women's work was being ignored by the official service for reasons that they have also admitted that they couldn't count women's work properly, we took up a survey with a different methodology. The methodology was for in each of the household, survey household, we prepared a list of about 13 jobs which were all my contributing to the real income of the family. The jobs were either paid jobs where there was money payment or tasks for which the, there was a market in that area but the family used to use fam their family labor to do that work. So the, some work was unpaid, some work was paid, all of it was listed in those uh, in that list. And every adult person was asked, not asked whether she was or he was a worker or not. They were asked whether they'd done any of the tasks that we had listed in the last six months, if they had done it, for how long, how frequently were they paid for it, and how much were they paid for it. From this, we anal analyzed the data to find out the average time that women and men had been working on this kind of economically meaningful task and their total earn yield from that and how that divided between men and women to see who was doing what work. Our findings clearly brought out two major points. One was the usual method of identifying workers and their occupations did little towards explaining how households were surviving, what, how they made their living. These estimates left out most workers, especially most women workers, and the many kinds of their activities that were is all essential for the survival of the household. That about two-thirds of rural women and about half of adult women in West Bengal were working on an average, were working for at least four, hour, four hours or more during each day on many kinds of these activities to achieve a livelihood. Men were working for longer hours, but then they were registered as employed. These women were not. These figures were some significantly higher than what census and NSSO service had been telling us, which where their say NSSO last survey had said shown that about 16% of rural women and 11% of urban uh, adult women in the workforce, the rest were not working. We found two thirds of rural women and about half of uh, urban women fulfilling that. Uh, the requirements to be a main, called a main worker. Another, however, very few women had regular jobs that brought in money income, and but a quarter of women were working as unpaid help in the family income and earning activities. It was clear that whenever need arose, women undertook more work and longer hours of work. However, even in, 19, 2000, in 2004, when the survey was conducted, it was clear that these very arduous efforts, efforts mainly of women, were not always able to lift households out of poverty. Oh, by the way, in, our, in the task that we had listed, we had not included water, collecting water, which was a very time consuming thing since the nearby tube wells hardly ever work. But uh, we included fuel because that was uh, a task that had a market in the area. However, even in 2004, it was clear that these arduous efforts made mainly by women 
were not always able to lift households from poverty. Especially women's work could contribute little and they had neither, since they had neither skills nor capital in their activities and their load of housework limited their mobility. Therefore, in the decade after those survey work, reports showed that men and women were resorting to new ways of earning their livelihoods. There was a lot of increase in the non-agricultural uh, work in rural areas such as in transport industry. And much more important, a lot many men and women were either migrating or commuting for work to cities for earning a money income. And that in a way must have accounted for the fall in poverty that we have noted. So even when women work, um, commuted to the city, they usually worked in domestic service or some such low paid service job. But nevertheless, it was a cash contribution to the family. Now, so what is happening now? We don't have any, you know, there's a lot of stories about the horrors of what's happening in uh, all over Bengal, but really there's no official data, confirmation of any of the information. But the last uh, couple of years have been very hard on West Bengal. The Amphan cyclone destroyed households and destroyed houses, salinized land and destroyed household uh, yeah, livings for many of the people. And the migrants and the commuting workers were grounded with the lockdown. And they had to come back to their house, uh, old rural households and to find, try find a living there. So what are they doing? How, how are they surviving in these conditions? The only source of information we have is from several non-government organizations that have been doing relief work with the migrant workers or with the workers affected by the cyclone. And they, their reports show that men are working on relief work, or the, mostly the Nereka work that has been uh, uh, that goes on in rural areas. But otherwise, they're feeling, finding very little work. They're feeling sorry for themselves. There's a lot of increase in alcohol, alcoholism, and drug use, and in domestic violence. There is increase in child marriages, child labor, and also trafficking of children and women. According to available reports, the women who of the households who are making every kind of effort to ensure the survival of their families. Stories of their multiple activities that they are undertaking are truly un uh, awe inspiring. Some are going out to sea in small, roughly made boats with nylon nets to catch and tie the fish. The boats keep turning over the women, dunking the little women in the water. But they never let go of the fish catch and they bring it to the shore where it's sold to the middlemen for very nominal amounts. They stand in very steep water to collect fish, fish fingerlings, again for sale. They've been running from pillar to post to get relief material or, spe or special ration cards or health cards. A group of women I know have been haunting as state agencies to prevent all salinized land, salinized land, that the land was salinized in the cyclone, to be, and there are large sharks into the rural area trying to grab that land and turn it into prawn cultivation. Women know that once this land is used for prawn cultivation, it will never be useful for cultivation again. So they've been fighting for stopping that uh, those uh, berries and those uh, uh, prawn uh, prawn farms. Their tube wells have fallen in uh, 
despair and it takes months to get a tubal repair and in South Bengal water unless it comes from a deep tubal is not safe so they walk miles for that. Although the gas subsidy has helped, even subsidized gas is too expensive and women are still hunting for fuel and fuel is getting scarcer and scarcer in Bengal. So it's women's flexible and elastic effort in these dire days which are which prove that Indian patriarchy has indeed managed to acquire the best possible resource for its household, for its household survival. Who else but early what else but early marriages and glorification of female chastity could have afforded a substitute for this? The question is, how do we explain women's acceptance of these grossly unfair distribution of responsibilities? Why do they accept that it is they that have to bear the load of finding a living whatever calamities that fall on the household? It is not that they do not complain or do not protest, but ultimately they opt for keeping the family together, whatever the cost to them. Presumably the explanation lies in what Amartya Sen is called social technology. The social arrangements which lay down the rules about who does what and in what in that society and what they legitimately deserve as their share. Women's bargaining strength in intra-family conflict is severely handicapped by their lack of option or a fallback position in case they are losers in the conflict. As mentioned earlier, majority of women in, their, in our society are married too early to acquire any marketable skills and even if they now start earning little income, it's not sufficient to maintain them and their children. So, the natal families are usually not in a position to take them back if they're thrown out of their husband's house because they don't have the money and of course there are social norms against it as well. And there's a tacit social sanction for domestic violence and socialization of women into being ashamed into, to admit that they've been, that, you know, that there's violence against them in the family. So it is, It is also true that single women are considered game for sexual violence. Therefore, women are very like to keep their uh, shaka shidur to as a sort of a protection against sexual violence. The threat, the threat of chastity loss, acts as an ultimate deterrent or deterrent, deterrent to women's protest about familial exploitation. It is not unjustified to suspect that, in spite of women's constitutional rights, the state in India still supports this intra-family power structure and women's role in ultimate, as ultimate providers. It is indeed a triumph of Indian patriarchy and its gendering norm that even in this critical situation, the family and its women are still the best social insurance system available at least for men. Thank you, Professor Banerjee, for your very illuminating and informative discourse this evening. So we have all enjoyed your lecture very thoroughly. Look forward to meeting you on future occasions also. Once again, I on behalf of the Asiatic Society, extend you a very, very hearty welcome and also extend our heartfelt thanks to you for very kindly agreeing to deliver today's lecture. Thank you, Madam, once more.